Good morning, good Thursday morning to you. It is our time that we have um, been given to join together to study God's Word together, to discuss God's Word together. I pray you've had a great week. I pray you are staying healthy. I pray you are being safe. Uh, I also hope that you uh, read the passages that we had for homework. Uh, we, were going, we are going to start there, um, but I pray that you all have read those passages so that we can uh, approach this Bible study together. Uh, thank you for joining us each week. Uh, I pray that this has been a helpful series. It has for me as I have been um, reading the Gospels and um, becoming reacquainted with Jesus myself. And anytime we read the Gospels afresh, there's always um, new principles, uh, new details that we learn to help us to learn and grow as God's sons and God's daughters. Let's share in a word of prayer and we will get started. Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity to hear from you. We ask that that is what happens, that you speak to us in accordance with your perfect will, in accordance with your word, as we seek to be better sons and daughters of yours, better followers of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, if any of these passages and stories are familiar, make them unfamiliar to us. Glorify yourself edify your people. It is in your son Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. So today, as you see on our title, uh, we are going to discuss Jesus's mission. I posed the question on yesterday um, in the post uh, previewing our study, what is Jesus's mission? And if you did the homework reading Luke chapter 4 verses 18 and 19, uh, reading Matthew chapter 25, verses uh, 31 through 46, you have the answer to a degree. We're going to attempt to uh, unpack the significance of them. And then the second question, what does his mission have to do with us? What does his mission have to do with our mission, our purpose for being on earth, our mission and our purpose and our goals of being his disciples. So uh, let's get right into it. Turn with me with your Bibles to Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. Just to set up the context, uh, on last week as we talked about spiritual warfare, in Luke's version of the gospel, um, Jesus is coming from being in the wilderness where he was led by the Holy Spirit and he has responded to the devil's temptations with God's holy word the same way you and I are to engage in spiritual warfare responding with scripture in context as we talked about on last week um, he is coming out of the wilderness he's coming back home to Nazareth and as was the norm in this culture, uh, men were allowed to teach in the synagogue setting, in the temple setting. So it says he came on the Sabbath day as it was his custom. He stood up to read and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. This is verse 17. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. And before I read that, he is quoting Isaiah 61. So again, when Jesus gives his mission statement, he's not making up new scripture. He is reading and communicating scripture that has already existed and that those who were in the temple, those who believed in God already, would hear this, know it, would remember it, and Jesus does give some explanation and some uh, reinterpretation, some clarification uh, of it. So here's what he says, and I'll get into the, some more of the contextual details. Here's what Jesus said as his mission statement. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me 
because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to release, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So he makes those five statements. He reads that scripture and he lets them know that is what he came to do. Now, as they, if, if they didn't already believe, as they would come to understand and believe later on, he was the Messiah. As we've talked about previously, there were some versions of the Messiah they wanted. Given the oppression they were experiencing, given the marginalization they were experiencing, they wanted a Messiah who was going to be their new king, who was going to overthrow the government. Some of them even wanted it to be done by any means necessary. And so Jesus is telling them by quoting scripture what essentially they should have already known is letting them know, yes, I'm the Messiah, but I'm not going to approach this the way you want me to. I'm not going to approach this the way you expect me to. I'm going to approach this the way um, God has sent me to, the way God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. And it's, that's key because he said the spirit of the Lord. And so even before he sends the Holy Spirit, um, before he sends the Holy Spirit, as we find in Acts, which Luke is also the uh, author of. And in fact, Luke and Acts in the original context and original writing is just one book. It's been split into two uh, in our Bibles, but Luke and Acts is just one book uh, in the original language. And so he's telling them up, up front that the spirit is even present then. And we know um, that doing the doing the word study in the original Hebrew language in Genesis, that the Holy Spirit has always been around. So Jesus is saying we have always wanted it to happen this way. And so we're coming to to set it straight. And this is what we are coming to do. This is what I am coming to do. He tells them these makes these five statements. And he tells them that he's bringing good news to the poor. Now, yes, it's the poor in spirit, somewhat in line with the Beatitudes we find in the Gospel of Matthew. But it's not only the poor in spirit, as we talked about in Jesus' roots, as we talked about in each of these lessons and these sessions, we have to be careful that we don't over-spiritualize what Jesus says and what Jesus does. Jesus was also talking about people who were in literal financial poverty because there were people and Jesus chose to be born into a family that was poor. He was he chose to be a part of a community that was not known for wealth. He chose to be a part of a situation and a people who were in poverty, who were being oppressed, who were being marginalized. And so He's telling them, I have some good news to bring and to remind them that God is on the side of those who are marginalized and oppressed. Then he says, proclaim release to the captive. Yes, those who are captive by sin in a spiritual sense. And, and many, if not all of us, have some sin that we wrestle with personally. Uh, whether it's a mental thing, it's an emotional thing. Uh, it's a physical it's a physical challenge. We all have some sin that we're wrestling. And what Jesus says, yes, I am. I am here to liberate you from having to be held captive by sin through my word and through my witness. But then there's also a level of sin that is communal, which is why we started with spiritual warfare before we got to this mission, because there are systems in place to keep certain people captive in poverty certain races captive, uh, even even in some sense, there are men uh, who try to keep women captive and and uh, people of certain genders and, and all of this that we try to keep certain people in certain social categories and locations captive. And we can even see that after this response, they asked, isn't this Joseph's son? In some ways, that was a, a, a condescending statement, basically saying, who is he to say anything to us like this? We know where he's from. We know his family. We know his background. We know his lineage, which we'll get to in a second, which we always talk about positively as we should. 
Um, but some people knew the people in his line. And so this was not a compliment. And so when Jesus says to proclaim release to the captives, uh, they didn't like that either uh, because he was telling them up front is that he was getting ready to deal with um, the, this priestly excess that we talked about with his with his roots. He's getting ready to deal with things not only on a personal level, but on a communal level. And that we would also have his followers uh, would have the his word to go by and how to approach dismantling systems of oppression so that everyone is not only free and liberated spiritually, but also practically. He goes on to say recovery of sight to the blind. God wants us to see clearly. God wants us to not be spiritually blind. And if we have spiritual clarity, we can see clearly spiritually. We can see with grace healed eyes. We can also be able to bring clarity to others by our presence, by our witness, by our votes, um, by everything we do. We can have conversations. We can utilize our social media to help people to see the world as God sees it, to remind people that God loves everybody. God wants everyone's needs to be met. Uh, God wants everyone to be loved, so on and so forth. And we know those things. If we don't know them, we have God's word to read, to get to the get to that clarity. And, not, and as we pray, and we read, we prayerfully read, we ask God to lead and guide us as we read, to give us clarity on what his word means. And not only clarity on what his word means, but then what God would have us to do such that uh, people can know what he wants them to do personally as families, as a community, as churches. He continues, he goes and says, let the oppressed go free. That is, that's related to the captivities, and Jesus is putting a couple of verses together. Jesus wants people to be liberated. He wants us to be free holistically. And that means starting with knowing what God created us to do, where God created us to do it, and even how God create and what God creates, how God wants us to accomplish the purpose that God has given us. That is freedom. Not some of this other stuff that is out there. Freedom is I know who God created me to be. I know who I am in Christ. And now from that, I can respond to everyone. I can respond to everything. And then and, and even in that sense, then I am not bowing to other people's expectations of me then I'm okay when people don't understand why I'm doing what I'm doing because I know I'm doing what God called me to do. Now, we have to be careful with that and, and we don't slip into this is what I want to do, so I'm going, going to do it because then we don't always have God's protection. We don't have God's protection when we're doing whatever we want to do, how we want to do it, when we want to do it. But when we're obeying God and people are not always going to understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. People are not always going to agree with it. People are not always going to like it. People are not always going to support it. That happened to Jesus. And, and there are times when we're obeying God, people are going to reject us too. And so we just have to do as best we can discern, know what God wants us to do, where God wants us to go, how God wants us to do it. And as we do that, we participate with God in removing the oppression of people, and the marginalization of people. And then he says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We've talked about the debts that people had. We talked about how certain people in certain geographical locations uh, and even some of the uh, racial and ethnicity tensions that were there that were taking place, what was going on with that piece. When he talks about this uh, release, um, uh, the year of the Lord's favor, excuse me, it is in reference to the year of Jubilee that we find those details in the Hebrew Bible, particularly in Leviticus, where every 50 years, no matter how much debt a person had, what the circumstances were, everyone was made debt free. And a part of that was to remind, remind the people that what is on earth, resources are God's. God is the source. Everything and everyone else are resources. And so God was using that to remind them that you don't own anything. You are stewards of everything. 
And so God wanted to remind them by putting that in practice to make sure that they don't hold people in debt unnecessarily and that people are not in debt for generations and that land wasn't taken from families because land is related to inheritance and things of that nature. And that should inform our responses as well. We should not be putting other people in debt. We should not be a part of systems that put people in debt and grinding poverty. Uh, and then that kind of even goes to the communal level when we look at some of the redlining, gentrification and things of that nature, which gentrification is not even the best word to use for what is going on in some of our communities. Uh, but that's another conversation for another day. So, so in essence, in, in summary, Jesus was coming and he came and is still active through you and I as we obey him to bring economic, social and political equity and equality. Uh, I always use equity and equality. Um, we have to have equity before we can get to equality. Uh, there's a picture on, on, the, on the Internet. If you search for equity, search for what is equity, what does equity look like? There is a picture of three people standing behind a fence. And each of them are standing on something. One person is standing on the ground. The middle person is standing on a, on a box to be the same height as a person standing on the ground. And then there's a third person who's standing on a higher box so that they can be at the same level and see what's on the other side of the fence. That is equity. We have to be open and honest and real about how the circumstances in which we live and where we find ourselves right now. Um, and where we are is that there are some people who over time have some demographics over time. We are fighting the uphill battle in certain areas. And so equity is when we put a system in place to create those opportunities where there's an equal playing field. If we do that, then over time there'll be equality. And so Jesus was about understanding the, 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 the reality of his situation and the context in which he came into during his time on earth. And so again, he was there to bring economic, social, and political equity and equality. And we see the people's responses to it. Read verses 20 through, I think it goes to 30. Yep, 20 through 30. And we can see the people's response that they, they weren't happy about this sermon that Jesus preached. They weren't happy about Jesus declaring this mission statement, right? So, um, again, that goes back to when we obey God, people are not always going to be our cheerleaders. They're not always going to be supportive. Uh, they're not always going to um, believe that we're doing the work of the Lord and things of that nature. Um, but that does not absolve us from obeying. And if we obey, we've discerned that what God is telling us to do. And if we do that, then we have to trust that God's hand is on our life. We have to trust uh, that God is, is trusting us. We have to trust uh, that God is protecting us. His hand is on us. And he is going to. Uh, make sure that we're taken care of in every way as we continue to obey him, trust in him, trust in his word. Now, since that's Jesus's mission statement, that should be our mission statement. Not only should it be our mission statement, we can evaluate whether or not we are Jesus's disciple by whether or not our lives have these effects. Luke chapter 4, 18 and 19. If we want to know if we are living in our purpose, if we want to know if we are doing what God calls us to do, God is not trying to trick us or booby trap us. It's right here in his word. Jesus tells us what he came to do. And over and over again, when he says it's for us to follow him, he wants us to follow him and do this. We always talk about we have the spirit. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us to do the same thing that the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jesus to do. So, if you have any question, you want to know, am I living in the purpose God has created me to live in? Am I doing what God created me to do? Am I going in the direction God wants me to go in? If your life is bearing this fruit, then we can say yes. If not, today is the perfect day to have that conversation with God. 
to get into his word, to discern what our purpose is, what our, you know, and what our purposes are as a body of believers and so on and so forth, so that we can do what God has created us to do. And then here's the blessing. Go to Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46. And I'm not going to read it in its entirety. Jesus is about to be arrested um, and the ball is getting ready to roll in the direction of crucifixion. And he gives this last um, instruction to his disciples. And I want to read... Um, I want to read verse 41 through, well, let me read, I'm going to read, I'm going to read it in the positive. I'll start at verse 31. When the son of man comes in his glory, this is what was going to happen in the end times when Jesus evaluates us. Um, he talks about sheep and goats. And, and of course, we know we want to be sheep. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another. as a shepherd separates the sheep, the sheep and the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer the Lord. Lord, when was it? When we saw you hungry and gave you food and thirsty and gave you something to drink. And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them. Truly, I tell you, just as you did to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then for the rest of the passage, he talks about the opposite. Where there are people, there are people who claim to know him, but their actions show that they really didn't believe him as a son of God and they really didn't know him because they didn't take care of people. They didn't meet people's basic needs, their policies, their politics, uh, their, their attitudes were not geared toward helping the least of these. And I, I believe if you're joining me right now, if you're listening to this at any time. You want to be a sheep and being a sheep means that we participate in every area of our lives and every level of our lives, uh, personally, professionally, politically and otherwise. And God meeting the needs of his people with his resources. And we have to remember we're stewards, not owners. So here's a statement of summation uh, from Oberium Hem Hendricks, Jr., uh, if you go on our website, you'll see the three books that are resources and secondary sources that we're using uh, to guide us on this study. Of course, the Bible comes first and foremost. That's why we're reading so much scripture. Um, but one of the books is The Politics of Jesus. And here is a statement that uh, Dr. Hendricks make in, re in relation to Jesus' mission. By Jesus' measure... Our lives are judged on whether we have tried to relieve the plight of the hungry, dispossessed, and those stripped of their freedom. Whether we have tried to change this war-torn world to a world free from oppression and exploitation so that all of God's children might have life more abundantly. Let me read it one more time. By Jesus' measure, our lives are judged on whether we have tried to relieve the plight of the hungry, dispossessed and of the and those stripped of their freedom whether we have tried to change this war-torn world to a world free from oppression and exploitation 
so that all of God's children might have life more abundantly. And that is from Wilberian Henry. He's a professor. He's the author of The Politics of Jesus. Now let's look at, we talked about Jesus' mission statement. Now let's look at some examples of Jesus' mission shown. Jesus never just tells us what to do. He always shows us how to do it. And as he shows us how he did it, that informs how we can do it in the right now and even the not yet. Let me also take this time to say I've, I've encouraged you, if you have Netflix, uh, they have all four Gospels on Netflix for us to watch. And it's not just a movie type production. What they do is they have a narrator who reads these of the gospel word for word from the New International Version. The actors and actresses are speaking Aramaic, which was Jesus's native tongue, his people's native tongue in the background. And as the narrator is reading the gospel, we see the, the gospel depicted on film. And it's not just a sensationalized. It does give us accurate imagery to what the culture and context of, of the Bible is and was. So again, I want to take this time to encourage all of us to make some time. Uh, we watch Netflix and other streaming services. We watch TV. Um, it would be well worth our time if we invested the time in watching um, the Bible. And then we have the added benefit. As we watch it, we're hearing and seeing scripture read. And if we can hear and see scripture read, we have the added imagery of our eyes being able to see it. That will help us concretize some of these lessons uh, that we're, we're having these discussions about, not only on Bible study, but also on Sunday morning. Uh, even if you're listening to other sermons and other churches and uh, reading other books, that visualization will be helpful uh, as we as we seek to understand scripture better. So Jesus missing shown. Number one, and we look at, at the first bullet there, Matthew chapter one, uh, verses one through 17. We have the genealogy of Jesus. And that is not by accident that Jesus chose a particular family to be born into. Yes, he was in David's line. Uh, but if we know, if we read our Bible and we learn about those characters, number one, although David is called a man after God's own heart, David was far from perfect. Uh, David was not the best father. David was not the best husband. Um, David didn't always do the best as king, uh, but God still speaks highly of him. And that's encouraging to me because I know me, I know the mistakes that I've made. Um, and so we know that uh, we have some issues that we need to address, and yet God does not leave us alone. God does not um, take us out of not um, uh, being able to be used by him in spite of our flaws. So uh, we look through that genealogy. Jesus chose men and women, and that's important because typically in this day when there were um, uh, people written uh, stories written, genealogies were included in this day and age when the Gospel of Matthew was written. However, women typically weren't included in the genealogy. But this was done on purpose. God inspired the writer of Matthew to do this on purpose because God has always intended for equity and equality among men and women. And so he includes women in the genealogy and it includes particular women uh, to show that it's not just one particular race or ethnicity that God is concerned about, but all races. Not just one walk of life, but all walks of life. And God has always intended for uh, it to be open to everyone to obey his holy word. God does have ways that we respond to being in relationship with him, but it should be available and open to everyone in all walks of life. Uh, then we get to Chapter 6, verses 5 through 15, that is, we have what we call the Lord's Prayer. It's also found in Luke chapter 11. Um, I did have a typo. I put that in the mission statement that should have been under Jesus' mission shown. And so when we see those two places, um, to really boil it down, uh, and please read these passages, 
But Jesus is instructing them to treat everyone's needs as holy. Uh, Jesus has always intended for us to make other people's needs more important than our own. Notice in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus never tells them to pray using I, me, or my. It's always we, us, and our. And it wasn't just teaching them how to pray because they knew how to pray. Uh, all of them were Jewish, so they had been taught how to pray since they were kids, just as you and I teach our kids to pray uh, from early on. So they knew how to pray, but Jesus was reminding them and even clarifying and teaching them about a reorientation that needs to take place in their society, in their culture. It really needs to take place in ours because we live in a culture that emphasizes independence and upward mobility for me, my, me and mine and not everybody. And that is never God's desire. And so Jesus telling them to treat everyone's needs as holy. Keep going to that other passage, Matthew 21 through 16. If you read through that, that is Jesus uh, exposing the workings of oppression. Uh, many times these Pharisees tried to uh, catch him up and catch him and try to trick him into doing some things. And he responded to them and he was telling these stories and he was also talking to um, uh, his disciples when they could hear him. And people were getting frustrated because if you and I did the same job, but one of us worked longer, the one that works longer should be paid more. That is, we get into this comparison game of, well, if, if both of us are doing the same job, why is it that it appears that God is blessing them more than blessing me? Why does it appear that they have more than I have, that they have financial stability and I don't? When God says in this parable, Jesus tells them in this parable, reminds them, this is God's money, this is God's earth, this is God's property, so on and so forth. We are just stewards. So who are we to tell God what to do with what's God's? And we fall into that trap. Now, do we hold people accountable for doing what we should hold our leaders accountable? But we have to be careful that we, try, we don't try to legislate uh, what God does with what is God's in the first place. It's our responsibility to trust and obey. And, and then we have to bow to how God chooses to do what God chooses to do when God chooses to do it. And as we do that, uh, we'll see that God will take care of if we participate and we can participate in this. God is always on the side of the oppressed and the marginalized. And God will take care of people's needs being met. It is our responsibility as we trust and obey, and a part of trusting and obeying is being a part of everyone's needs being met. And as we do that, uh, it will expose further any oppression and marginalization going on. And as I said on Sunday, we just have to make sure we're doing our part, individually and collectively, as a body of Christ, as families, as individuals, do our part. And as we do our part, we'll be identified as sheep and not as goats. We'll be identified that even no matter where we are geographically or physically, that if we're doing the Lord's work, we know God's hand is on our lives and he will protect us uh, from what, um, what danger we may find ourselves in. Drop down to Mark. Jesus shows himself in Mark to be fulfilling this mission as well. Mark chapter 5, 1 through 20, in which we kind of talked about this. He is uh, engaging with this demon. He asked the demon, what is the demon's name? The demon says, my name is Legion. Jesus uses that uh, spiritually and politically. Yes, spiritually, they talk about what spiritual warfare. And last week, he teaches us how to deal with, with and, and respond to demons. But when he said Legion, there were Roman soldiers around, Roman officials around, and even uh, Pharisees around who were in cahoots with the Roman government. So for that demon to call himself legion, it could have meant that it was thousands of them there. But legion was also a military term, a term that was in line with the Roman government who was oppressing the people. And so Jesus was letting them know that their systems and the Roman government, the way that they were treating people was demonic. The way that they were worshiping Caesar was demonic. The way that they were um, making all previous Caesars into gods and their other Roman gods, and all of that was demonic. And so 
uh, there is that piece that Jesus is saying to them publicly. Uh, and he has this display of those demons going into the pigs. He's telling them, uh, I am here to begin the process. Or I should say continue the process of um, being on the side of those who are oppressed and marginalized. And in particular, in this context of that Roman government. We jump over to um, Mark 11, 15 to 19, Mark 13, 1 and 2. That is uh, Jesus giving a voice to the voiceless. Okay. Um, there, there are people who we have to, uh, we have to speak up for. Uh, there are people you and I have influence with, and there are people who, um, will listen to us and they won't listen to other people. I can give you an example that as a man, unfortunately, uh, there are some men who will listen to me and they may not listen to, uh, women. And that's not right. That is downright sinful. Um, however, that is the case. Uh, I, I had to during my time in seminary, and I thank uh, God for sending me to, to Vanderbilt Divinity School. Uh, I had to confront, and it's still a process at times, I had to confront my male privilege. That there are some, some privileges I have as a man um, that, that some women don't. And so I have to make sure, even with my language, that I confront my male privilege, that I be honest about that there has been abuse of even the Bible and how uh, men are talked about, the spaces men are given uh, opportunities to, to serve and to work. We saw this in the 2016 election. There were people who to this day will tell you that they didn't vote for Hillary Clinton because they don't believe a woman should be president. Um, and that still exists, unfortunately, in our day and time. Uh, and so there are times that people will listen to us for various reasons. That even happens in our family. That happens on our jobs. That happens in the home at times. That certain people will listen to us and they won't listen to other people. And we should always be about the Lord's business and using our voice to communicate in such a way that people are open to God and open to God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven, the equity and equality politically, economically, and socially that God has always been about. So in those passages, those are examples. Mark chapter 14, um, that is verses 3 through 11. Jesus is anointed. Uh, his feet are anointed in the house. And uh, his disciples tried to tell her that she was wrong. What is interesting in this culture, when they were in, in houses, it was a custom and it was the hospitality to, uh, because of the terrain they walked in, their feet would be dirty and the sandals that they wore and walking in the sand and things of that nature. They were to offer um, their guests, they were to offer them uh, basins of water to wash their feet and, and a towel and, and, and certain things to do that. And they didn't do that for Jesus. And then they get mad at the woman. They get mad at the woman. Somebody must not know Bible study going on. Um, um, they got um, mad at her for anointing Jesus' feet. And Jesus tells them that she was doing the right thing and they weren't. Now, it sounds like Jesus saying something specific about his feet being washed. But the deeper point is... They had gotten so comfortable around Jesus that they no longer approached him with reverence in that moment. They had to be reminded about being reverent. Now, we should be reverent. And Jesus showed that as people are reverent, that's when their sins will be forgiven. I'm going to use the statement of summation to explain what I mean. Let me say this as a side note. We have to be careful with some of these slogans and these phrases we say. Even some of these slogans that are on T-shirts, you know, like Jesus is my homeboy. You have to be careful with that because we can get so comfortable with Jesus that we forget who Jesus is. We can be so comfortable and, and buddy buddy about it and we stop being reverent to Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Yes, Jesus um, wants us to have that intimate relationship, with comfortable, vulnerable. Transparent. That's why our prayers don't have to be all of this stuff we 
um, seem to be professional and, and particular. God just wants us to be straight up and down with him, be open and honest with him. He already knows. He wants us just to communicate. He wants us to vent. And as we do that, as we vent, as we're open and honest, that'll help us to not have to vent to other people and tell our, tell our business to God and we won't be tempted to tell our business to other people. We open and honest with God, uh, we'll even be in a better place mentally and emotionally. Uh, we want to dump on other people all the time. Now, if we do need to do that, that's fine. We do it with someone that is, is trustworthy and confidential. If we need to get Christian counselors, get Christian counselors. Uh, and God wants us to be open and honest. But we have to be careful that we don't uh, get so comfortable with Jesus that we forget being reverent, okay? Because that's what happened here. And they thought because they thought some stuff about this woman because she took her hair down, because that suggested certain professions, and that wasn't necessarily the case. That was the, the hang-up of the disciples and other people in the house that was a hang-up of the woman. And it doesn't say in particular uh, what the woman's sins were. We're just, you know, we, we're just making some assumptions and presumptions because at the end of the day, um, that's between, that was between her and God. Now, there was someone she needed to ask forgiveness for, sure, but again, that wasn't their place in that moment, and Jesus tells them as much. And so, again, we have to make sure that we are open, honest, transparent, and vulnerable with Jesus. We have intimate relationship but we don't get so comfortable with Jesus that we're not reverent, okay? So that happens there, and Jesus shows in that moment as he responds and, and, and corrects the disciples and is forgiving to this woman. He's continuing to show his mission. Uh, Luke, there, there are several passages there. I just want to flip through and give some general comments. I know we're short on time, but again, I do want you all to read this. And again, if you watch those movies, we can watch it and hear it being read at the same time uh, via those movies on Netflix. Chapter 7, 36 through 50. Uh, this is when um, Jesus and, and someone else. Uh, Jesus hung out at people's house a lot, as you'll see. Uh, and this is another scene where his, uh, he was anointed um, um, about those feet and those cultural things that we see. Uh, how he responded. Please read that. Uh, chapter 14, 1 through 6. Um, uh, Jesus heals a man. Um, it was on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees got upset, saying, don't heal on the Sabbath. Uh, as I talked about with those laws, we talked about the session with the laws. There were extra stuff that the Pharisees were putting on top of God's law instead of allowing God's law to be God's law. Um, and Jesus clarifies that for us over and over again in terms of if we love God and love people, everything will be taken care of under God's law. They had turned the, what was a relationship into a religion. And again, Christianity is supposed to be a relationship with God. And when we have a relationship with God, then that is going to affect how we live, our behavior, what we do and do not do, right? Um, when we make it into a religion, it becomes something forced as opposed to being a relationship. And we choose to live in accordance with who God has created us to be in accordance with his word. And so they got all been out of shape about when somebody's needs are being met, how somebody's needs was being met, instead of just focusing on the fact that someone's needs were being met. And so Jesus told them, uh, he says, you know, he goes ahead and he heals them. And he asked the lawyers, verse 3, is it not lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not? But they were silent. So Jesus took him and healed him and sent him away. Then he said to the Pharisees, if one of you has a child or an ox that is falling into a well, will you not immediately pull it out on the Sabbath day? And they could not reply to this. That is, they knew they were wrong. They knew that the important piece was for needs to be met. And so they were trying to uh, get in his way and not just participate in uh, his needs being met. So uh, going on to chapter 16, verses 19 through 31, the rich man and Lazarus. We see this story that Jesus tells. And with the rich man and Lazarus, um, the rich man thought he was doing everything he was supposed to do. 
Then he died. Lazarus, who was a poor man that he ignored all of his life. Lazarus was, this was not the same Lazarus in John chapter 11 from this story that we know uh, that Jesus resurrected. This is a different Lazarus. Lazarus actually was somewhat of a common name back then. But there was a rich man who, while he was living on earth, he ignored Lazarus. He ignored people like Lazarus. He did not use God's resources, God's money to make sure everyone's needs were met. And, and this should be instructive even of our day and time. Um, the man would be outside the, the, the city and in the context and the culture, people who were sick and deemed unclean uh, were put in certain parts of the community away from uh, people who were clean, who were healthy, and so on and so forth, who um, were taught or thought of in a certain way by the society and not necessarily defined about how God um, how God sees us and defines us. So this rich man ignored Lazarus and people like Lazarus. He did not uh, make sure that everyone's needs were met. He did not utilize God's resources as God intended, but he thought he was obeying some of these other, uh, he was obeying God otherwise. They die, Lazarus goes to heaven, and the rich man does not. Um, but in some shape, form, or fashion, this rich man can see from hell into heaven, and there's this conversation, and he tell and, and he said he lets him know, um, and let me just read that portion of it. Um, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, starting at verse twenty-four, and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. His mouth was burning hot. You know how we eat some hot sauce and our mouth is burning hot. That's what was going on. Um, but it wasn't from hot sauce, but he, he needed to be, he needed some coolness for I'm in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, child, remember that during your lifetime, you receive your good things and Lazarus in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Besides all this between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed. So that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Here it is. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither they will be convinced if someone rises from the dead. Here it is again. The Bible tells us the Bible is true. The Bible is real. The Bible is active. The Bible tells us what we need to know. We should trust in God through God's word, live in accordance with the Bible, not just the parts that we like, not just the parts that make us warm and fuzzy, but the Bible in its entirety. The Bible that even challenges and critiques us, calls us to be better, cause us to be sacrificial, cause us to be loving, giving, gracious to everyone. Uh, that is what he's saying here. They know the Bible. They're not listening to it. They don't believe it. They don't take it seriously. They only want to do what they want to do. And that's what you did. And we see the consequences. And so what he's saying here, we're not going to do something that how you want it to be done. God has prescribed how life is to be lived. And if they don't want to listen to God's word, then they don't want to listen to God. And we're not going to do something uh, fantastical just for them to do it. And we even see that in the miracles Jesus performed. Jesus did not perform miracles to induce people's faith. Jesus performed miracles for reasons. And each of those miracles has that reason. Listen, if we read those miracles, we see the purpose of those miracles. And they were never to prove that God existed. They were never to prove that God is. If those miracles were just snapshots of the supernatural, snapshots of what we can have. And that's why we have to be careful with with some of the ways that we talk about uh, life, even in the here and now. So that's that's uh, Luke 16, Luke 18, verses uh, nine through 14. Jesus goes and hangs out with the tax collector. Now, tax collector were considered traitors. Uh, they didn't like him. And then John uh, Luke 19, 1 through 10, similar thing there. He goes with Zacchaeus. People didn't hang out with tax collectors. They were seen as traitors. We talked about that in depth uh, with Jesus' roots. 
But Jesus did not mind being around whoever he was around, going to their house. But Jesus also didn't do everything they were doing in those houses. But Jesus did redeem them. He had those conversations. He presented them opportunities to change. And many times they were changed. Not all the time, but many times they were changed. And as we discover, as we talked about with Nicodemus in, in, in the Gospel of John, Nicodemus was not changed immediately in John chapter 3. But later on, Nicodemus was changed. And so let's let that be instructive for us. We do our part, we do our best, and we trust God to do the rest. Sometimes God just wants us to plant the seed and someone else will see the harvest of salvation, experience the harvest of someone's salvation. Sometimes God just wants us to plant the seed to help people learn and grow and mature spiritually. And other people will actually see uh, that seed grow and develop and things of that nature. That is not our responsibility to know which part of the process we're a part of. It is just our responsibility to live for God. And as we live for God, we love God and love all people and trust God to work through us. Turn to God to the Gospel of John. Those two scenes. Um, chapter four is where he meets the uh, Samaritan woman at the well. Um, that is a fascinating scene culturally. Again, Jesus was not supposed to talk to women in public. He was not supposed to talk to Samaritans in public. So Jesus is showing racial and gender equity and equality in this one scene. He does it in the middle of the day, knowing he's going to be seen. And then she leaves from that place. Jesus, she's forgiven by Jesus. And she starts a revival in Samaria. So again, God has always been and Jesus is showing it throughout. But here's an example and just a snapshot about Jesus wanting everyone of every race and ethnicity, every culture to have access to him and therefore access to what is his. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness of everything. everything is God's. We're just stewards. We should be making everything available to everyone, making sure everyone has access to uh, all their needs being met. And starting spiritually, but also practically. And that is shown there in that conversation he has. Now, John 8 is another situation in which he is encountered uh, and a woman is involved. And he's brought this woman and she's caught in adultery. I've always asked this question and I don't know the answer. I can make an assumption and a presumption. But they bring this woman who's caught in adultery. How did all these men know this woman was committing adultery? That, that's always been my question. And so Jesus, in his response, he listens to them. He, he kneels down on the ground. He writes something in the sand. He stands up and says, Who, um, whoever has it without sin, cast the first stone. Now, that is everybody, everybody around, the woman included, had sinned and was guilty of some sin, right? He wrote something in the sand. We, to this day, don't know what he wrote in that sand. Guess why we don't know? It's not our business. Point blank, period. He tells the woman to, to go and sin no more. That is, he doesn't condemn her. Go your, in verse 11, uh, neither do I condemn you. Go your way, and from now on, do not sin again. He forgave the woman just as we should forgive people. He showed us that. Uh, he showed us that he knew what was going on, and he knew what was going on in everybody's heart and everybody's mind. He knows it's going to everybody have heart and mind now. And if, if people yield to what he says, we follow his example, then the same effect will happen to us that happened on that day. Uh, and again, Jesus is not partial to any country. He's not partial to any race or ethnicity of people. He's not, he's not partial to any geographic location. Jesus is for everybody and with everybody. If we live for him. We, we're, we're his disciples, then discipleship would occur. More people will come into holistic salvation, spiritually and otherwise. So here's this statement of summation. It is long. It is from Philip Yancey in the book, The Jesus I Never Knew. Um, and, and I do encourage, if you don't have the books, to get them. They're great investments into um, our libraries. Here is a statement of summation. It's long, so I'm going to read it at least twice. Pharisees believe that touching an unclean person polluted the one who touched. But when Jesus touched the person with leprosy, Jesus did not become soiled. The leprous person became clean. When an immoral woman washed Jesus' feet, 
she went away forgiven and transformed. When he defied custom to enter a pagan's house, the pagan servant was healed. In word and in deed, Jesus was proclaiming a radically new gospel of grace. To get clean, a person did not have to journey to a place, offer sacrifices, and undergo purification rituals. All a person had to do was follow Jesus. And again, that's Philippians. Let me read it one more time. We're almost done. Pharisees believed that touching an unclean person polluted the one who touched. But when Jesus touched a person with leprosy, Jesus did not become soiled. The leprous person became clean. When an immoral woman washed Jesus' feet, she went away forgiven and transformed. When he defied custom to enter a pagan's house, the pagan servant was healed. In word and in deed, Jesus was proclaiming a radically new gospel of grace. To get clean, a person did not have to journey to a place, offer sacrifices, and undergo purification rituals. All a person had to do was follow Jesus. And that's the same thing today. All we have to do is follow Jesus. Do our best. Trust God to do our rest. We have accountability and responsibility as Christians. So let's do our best to follow Jesus, his example, um, as we find in Holy Scripture. Not what some other, somebody else says, but let's get to know Scripture for ourselves. Jesus' mission was and is success. If you look at the handout, and please get the handout, we talked about Jesus, his mission statement, his mission shown. That's the second piece. We went through these passages of Scripture. And then we have to understand his mission wasn't as successful. And that kind of points us to where we're going from here. Uh, next week, we'll talk about his crucifixion and its meaning. And, it, and it's, it's, excuse me, it's nuance. Yes, he died for our sins and the sins of all people. But if we look at the details of crucifixion, uh, it, it, it really does add to the meaning of Jesus dying for, our, for us. And specifically on the cross via Roman crucifixion. The next week we'll talk about his resurrection and then session 10 will be his ascension. And each of those were suggestions of his success. And what is fascinating is that the crucifixion, him dying was success, him suffering and all of that was, was, was successful. So um, our homework for next week, I want everybody, your favorite search engine, Dedicate some time to researching Roman crucifixion. OK, um, I mentioned those movies again. I want to mention it again. If you have Netflix, we spend time streaming TV shows. We watch movies. Um, you know, I give an example. I can't wait for the crown to come out. That that's one of my favorite Netflix shows. Uh, we binge watch shows. We record stuff on the DVR. And we can make time to watch the Bible. And as we watch in the Bible, we can see and hear it read. And so we're killing three birds or one stone if we spend that, if we invest that time in watching these four. All four Gospels are there. And that will enrich our understanding and engagement with Scripture if we do that. And share that with somebody else that, you know what, you can read the Bible hear the Bible and see the Bible all at the same time right on Netflix, something that many of us use almost on a daily basis. So I do want to encourage that. So again, we talked about Jesus' mission statement. Since it's Jesus' mission statement, it should be our mission statement. Not only that, but we can use that mission statement to evaluate whether or not we're living the purpose God has given us to live if we're having the effect on the world that Jesus had and is continuing to have and just ask, that, is Jesus having that effect on the world through me, through my life and the areas in which I'm functioning? Um, we, we showed those examples of it. That gives us some examples for us to follow in particular, not just what to do. That's the mission statement. The how is that Jesus showed his mission. I gave all of those passages and please read those. Um, and then um, his mission was successful. And we're going to get into that. And so we will we will know it for ourselves better. We'll see it for ourselves better. And then we'll be able to communicate with other people. We should always communicate these lessons that we're learning if it's been helpful. And I'm praying that it's been helpful. Uh, we can share this with other people. All right. Um, 
uh, shared those two quotes from those books and the Roman crucifixion that we'll talk about. There's some information in those books. So do that. All right. Thank you for joining us. I love you. If you have not already, please vote. Uh, hopefully this information we've talked about through Bible study helps inform my voting. Um, please vote uh, between now and Tuesday. Uh, let's pray that everything uh, is safe, everything goes well, that, that all this voter suppression stops, and that everybody can cast their vote safely and fairly, then all ballots are counted. Um, um, so we got the homework about Roman crucifixion. Please go vote. Join us on um, Sunday at noon. We'll continue our sermon series in the book of Revelation, hearing about Jesus' mission to the church. Have a great rest of today, a great weekend. We will see you on Sunday at 12 noon.